Humphrey. I'm here to talk to you about web accessibility. So we're going to start with what is web accessibility. Web accessibility is the inclusive practice of removing barriers that prevent interaction with or access to websites by users with disabilities. And when sites are, are designed, developed, and edited correctly, all users have equal access to information and functionality. So what kind of disabilities am I talking about? We're going to start with visual impairments. That includes blindness, color deficiencies, general poor vision, and low vision. Next, there's motor and mobility issues, such as difficulty or an inability to use your hands. Then there's auditory impairments, such as deafness or a loss of your hearing. Then we have seizures, most often caused by the disease epilepsy and then cognitive and intellectual disabilities. This includes developmental learning and cognitive issues such as dyslexia, dysgraphia, mm, memory loss, and general logic impairment. So what as coders can we do to help with that? Well, I'll tell you. We can write meaningful code. This includes meaningful HTML, meaningful um, semantic HTML, um, textual equivalents for images and links that are named meaningfully and this helps with text-to-speech software as well as text-to-braille software. Then we can also facilitate users who have low vision by having content images and text that are large or enlargeable without affecting the rest of the content on the page. For color deficient users, we need to differ differentiate color meanings. So most notably, we see this all the time with hyperlinks. We want to signify their purpose, and we see them underlined. And when you take the underline away, you need to make sure to signify it in some other way, that it's a button or something that can be clicked for users who have color deficiency, because they might not be able to tell. Another thing we need to do for users with color deficiency is make sure to not use in tandem colors that are commonly swapped, such as red and green or blue and yellow. So OK and cancel is usually red and green, and that's actually really difficult for some use, because it's just like gray for some people. <laughs> but next, to facilitate users who can't control a mouse with precision, we can have important areas that, like OK, have it a little bit larger. And then to facilitate users who can't use standard equipment and who need to navigate just by a keyboard or a single switch access, we can make sure to include in our code something like the tab index or focus. Also, we can use closed captioning or sign language versions of videos for users with auditory issues. And we can make certain effects optional, such as flashing lights. That's obviously a big one for some users. And then finally, we can make sure to use plain language. and with that also having illustrations with instructional diagrams or animations so that we can facilitate users with cognitive disabilities. But now that's like a list of items we can do, let's talk about the guidelines that already exist that can help us do that as well as current legislation that you might not be aware of. So first we have the Web Content Accessi Accessibility Guidelines created by the Web Accessibility Initiative of the World Wide Web Consortium. And they create most of the standards for all of our internet usage. These guidelines are very in-depth and actually many policies, both public and private, are based off of them because most governments have legislation that protect disabled users' access to websites. And in the U.S. right now, these user rights are protected by the American Disab Disability Act. And there have been some notable lawsuits actually target they settled out of court, but it cost them like $6 million as well as court fees to not have an accessible website. So, especially if you work at a big firm, this is important. Mm. So moving forward, we know that there's assistive technology such as screen readers, and these require semantic information to be able to process the content for users. So we need to make sure to have that semantic information. But unfortunately, as modern web applications are evolving, we're using scripts. We're applying them to our elements and making custom components, dynamic components. 
and that's yielding <laughs> single page applications that most all of us are using right now. With this, HTML tags and attributes are inadequate semantic sources as the custom components don't provide a way to have the HTML be meaningful for their state and how they relate to other elements. And that's what brings in ARIA. It's a specification that enables accessibility by allowing us to provide all of that information. It allows us to provide the semantics for describing a dynamic component's behavior, as well as by allowing us to expose a current state and how <coughs> an element relates to another. And finally, the most amazing and simple way that it helps is it allows us to, to utilize tab index and focus. So now, um, here's a little, um, oh, you can't see my mouse. But if you look here, you can see how these components relate to each other. The ARIA described by is using this ARIA specification. And it's saying I'm described by name tip. So you know when you find the ID name tip that these two are related, that this input is describing this div. And so that's a really simple example of how they relate to each other. And now I'm going to go into an example mm, using VoiceOver. It's the, the default on every Apple device, the default screen reader. And I'm going to just do some very basic jQuery. And what's going to happen is this nursery rhyme name is going to change. And we're going to see how this component, Aria Live, it has three different states it can be in. It can be an off, polite, and assertive. And I'm just going to show you polite and assertive and how they differentiate and how it can really affect a blind user's access to this website. And if we have time, I'll show you a couple more examples of a, the screen reader. But sometimes the screen reader takes a little while. So I'm going to let it run through, and I'm going to push start, which will start uh, changing it. And to activate VoiceOver, you use Command F5. Mm. So it should be started. I hope that we'll be able to hear it. Yeah, so I'll refresh the page. This is how it goes. Start button. Stop button. Though I choose one as my favorite, many nursery rhymes are worth reading. Hey, diddle diddle. Ba ba black sheep. So as you can see, voice over off. As you can see, um, with Aria Live Polite, it allows the voiceover to complete reading the entire page before letting the user know that something has updated on the page. But as you also may have noticed, it only read out the dynamic component that did change. So I'm going to show you an alternate to this, which is using ARIA Atomic True. It'll read this entire paragraph element so that the user can have some context to what changed, as well as I'm just going to go ahead and show you ARIA Live Assertive so you can see how that differs from Polite. So save that and then. My favorite nursery rhyme starts button. My favorite nursery rhyme is Georgie Porgy. My favorite nursery rhyme is Little Miss Muffa. My favorite nursery stop button. Voice over off. So the difference there was that, mm, I don't know if you can really see, but it doesn't let you keep going with assertive. So that's important for when you have a warning or a pop-up. But if you misuse that, it can completely prevent certain users from being able to access your website because they're constantly just hearing that you're updating <laughs> some sort of element. So I, if we have time, I'm going to show you a quick, this is another simple website. And it has a couple things that make it very difficult for users. So I'm going to go ahead and turn my voice over voice on. Over. Refresh the page. So it says the first thing that was kind of problematic there was that there's just an input and it doesn't have any sort of context to what it does or what it is. And then further, if you don't, if you have nested um, HTML, you want to make sure to 
make it semantically meaningful so a blind user can know going into it that we're on this kind of content and then we're going into it. And if you don't make that obvious in your HTML, it's very difficult for certain users. And moving forward. So that's enough of that. But you see that if you don't have an alternate for your image text to name it meaningfully, nobody will know if they can't see it what it is that they're supposed to be looking at, as well as for URLs, for links, you need to have meaningful names because just having here is not necessarily useful and having an entire URL is also very long to have to listen to. So that's the end of the demo for now. And you know, it disappeared, but I have some good resources if you guys are interested in learning anything more, and I mean, the biggest takeaway for me was the legislation, that it's important and you can be sued if you don't include access for all users. <laughs> so thank you so much for your time. <laughs>